Thank you guys for being here. Thank you for braving the rain. I'm Hunter Lewis, Editor-in-Chief of Food & Wine and Cooking Light. This is Chef Jonathan Waxman. We are so thrilled for you guys to be here. We're excited to show you a couple chicken techniques. We're going to mix, mix up some margaritas. Um, this is an honor for me. This is my first Food & Wine uh, Classic in Aspen, my first rodeo, having a blast. I know, I know there's many of you that this is your 20th, this is your 30th, and uh, I'm coming back next year. <laughs> so this is also an honor for me because Jonathan is a great friend. Um, I worked for him 11 years ago at Barbudo, a great restaurant in the West Village in New York. And Jonathan was one of my first mentors in the kitchen. Um, he taught me a lot about technique. He taught me a lot about how to cook. Uh, but what Jonathan really taught me and what he has taught countless other cooks um, and also his customers is, is a certain vibe. It's a certain California cool. Jonathan grew up um, in Berkeley and uh, has been a New, York, no, a New Yorker for, I don't know, 30-something years now. But he's still got the California cool, and, uh, and he sets a vibe, and, and that's what Jonathan's about. Um, so it's an honor to be here with you, man. All right, so... Thank you all. Um, uh, you all know what a chicken is, right? <laughs> We're not talking politics now, right? So uh, there's an old Cab Calloway song, A Chicken Ain't Nothing But a Bird. And uh, I always, um, I grew up in uh, Berkeley, as, as Hunter said, but I also, my grandparents had a chicken farm in Sebastopol. And um, honestly, I really hated being on the farm. They are um, not the most um, hospitable friends, chickens. They peck, they bite, they scratch, so I don't mind eating them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's said that my grandmother, who was um, a very smart uh, woman who was also probably the worst cook on the planet, she killed chickens twice. She killed them when she sent them to the butchery, and then she killed them when she cooked them. <laughs> Now, luckily, her daughter, my mother, was a wonderful cook. My mother, Adele, uh, she was, well, she was a pain in the butt, my mother, let's face it. My mother was the kind of person, she graduated high school two years early, graduated Hunter College two years early, and she was kind of a menace to society for 35 years. But she really, she really could cook, and she was a kind of cook that really did it naturally. The only thing she ever did bad was once she served tongue, and she forgot to peel it, but that's one of her stories. <laughs> all right, so, Hunter's gonna, all right, so, uh, at the, I'm gonna do it how we do at the restaurant, okay? So, and everybody, what's the magic? There is absolutely zero magic here. There is no magic whatsoever. Uh, there, there are a couple of things you need. You need good sea salt. I'm kind of anti-kosher salt these days, and I'm not gonna get into why. Um, Salt has become a whole, you know, like PhD. You know, you got you graduated now from Yale with a uh, PhD in salt, and uh, it's derivative. Um, but anyway, so at, at the restaurant, we and I'll show you. Uh, you want to do it with the scissors? I'll do it with the knife. Yeah, let's okay, go. So let's do it both ways. You do it though. You take one of these, one of these babies. Um, so anyway, the first rule is a good chicken, and what does that mean? Uh, there's so much nonsense about free range and natural and blah, blah, blah. You know, um, experiment. Find which one you like. Now, I, I, I'm so anti-plastic and birds and plastic. They got all that weird little pink juice inside there. It's really gross. So, um, so, I, I, so I advise everybody, when you get the chicken in the bag, the little plastic bag, you wear gloves, number one, and you, when you cut the bag open, do it over a sink so all that juice kind of dribbles out, and then you wash the chicken in the hottest water you possibly can. There's a couple reasons for that. One is you want to make sure that you rinse off all that pink juice. And then there's another kind of thing that I think happens is that you warm up the chicken. And everybody takes the chicken out of the refrigerator and they throw it in the oven. Bad idea. 
Um, bad mojo to, to do that. Anyway, so Hunter, you got the scissors. I'll do the knife. I completely disagree. Anyway, <laughs> it's okay. He's the, he's the editor, but I'm a lot older. <laughs> you doing scissors, I'm doing knife. Oh, you want to do that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. So um, the thing, uh, my father's favorite part of the chicken was the Pope's nose. How did the Pope get it? I don't know. Anyway. So when you want to cut, you cut right along the backbone, literally, and you want to get very sharp. These are really good poultry shears that I have no idea how to operate. And you want to get as close to the backbone as possible. And I'm going to use the, the backbone later, so we're not going to yep. throw these guys out. And I've done the same thing, so I've just used any kind of knife. If you have a cleaver, Chinese cleaver is great for this, or a chef's knife. And I've just gone down the, uh, the ribs on one side, and then I'll do the ribs on the other. So then what you do is you spatchcock the chicken. And what you, you get on your tippy toes. Put your hands on top of each other, and you literally crack open that wishbone, okay? And then with your knife, we have a guy at the restaurant that can do... Luis? Luis, no, Martin, who could do 400 orders in 20 minutes. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. Um, watching him, it's, it's phenomenal. Oh, with the knife, make sure that you don't have a dull knife. And again, up on your tippy toes. You're splitting yours. I'm splitting mine. Are you going to spatchcock it? Yeah. What does spatchcock spatch spatch mean? Clara, what does spatchcock mean? Any idea? Jess, any idea? I have no clue what spatchcock means. There's some, somebody out there that probably knows. So I'm actually removing the breastbone. So you got the little breastbone, which has a little bit of meat on it, so don't throw that away. And then we're going to, are you going to oil yours? Got a little olive oil, a lot of salt and pepper. Um, one of the big things that I learned under Jonathan is what separates a restaurant cook from a home cook is the amount of salt. There's several other things. I think restaurant cooks are a little more neurotic than home cooks, but a lot of salt. So if you're, at, if you're a home cook, uh, season more than you think. Chances are if you're doing chicken and, and you'll see with the potatoes, you're not using enough salt. And you gotta Use massage more. it. You gotta give that chicken a little massage. <laughs> get a little love, a little chicken love here. And um, I, I like using a freshly cracked pepper, but uh, when you do the pepper, do it up high. You broadcast the pepper, because you don't want little clumps of pepper getting in little crevices in the chicken. And so if you get that little bite. Again, what, what Hunter said about Salt goes equally true for pepper. It also looks really cool when you season on pie. You, you look like a pro. And uh, salt again up high, both sides. Everybody forgets to do, like with fish, they only do one side. Ah, forget about the other side. Do both sides, it's kind of important. And because we're, it's raining, we don't want to go outside, we're going to put these guys on this little guy right here. You hear that sound? You guys hear that back there? If you don't hear that when you're putting the chicken on a grill or chicken on the, on the pan, your pan's too cold. Um, you want to hear that sear uh, because that tells you that your pan is hot enough. I'll never forget one of the first nights on the line at Barbudo. Um, Jonathan came back and, you know, Jonathan sometimes is casually dressed in a uh, t-shirt and shorts, um, usually with a glass of rosé in his hand. You know, he's Mr. Cool, um, and I'm going to season the uh, underside here, too. And he, he said, dude, he says dude a lot, dude, 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 what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing, dude? I was like, what do you mean? He's got tickets piling up, and I'm stressed. Um, you know, when I first started, I had, I had 10 thumbs. I was not a fast cook. I he had 20 thumbs, let's face it. I, I didn't even know I had to hold a side towel. So he comes up and, and, and you know, it's one of the first times he'd ever really actually like, come talk to me when I was on the line. And uh, It's he not said, a good idea to talk to people on the line because uh, chefs are tweaked anyway. Um, and you don't want to tweak anybody too much, but he needed a little tweaking. And so, you know, I've got, I, I'm doing this uh, calamari salad that 
that Jonathan's known for, and, and you, you slice the squid, and, um, and you sear it in a really, really hot pan. And uh, he said, listen to your pan, dude. Listen to your pan. It's not hot enough. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. So, you know, full restaurant, 300 covers. Tickets are piling up. I've got the other line cooks next to me waiting for, for these dishes. And I turn the pan up, uh, up to high. And uh, he says, keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. Listen to the pan. Listen to the pan. Don't open your eyes. And I was freaking out. But what it taught me you was... You should have seen him, too. You know, it's... Um, you know, everybody says, like, is it easy to cook in a restaurant? Well, if you're on, like, Quaaludes or something. <laughs> There's a lot of responsibility. Remember, you don't want to kill any of your customers, at least not initially. <laughs> but what and it you, taught and, me and was... you do have... Who was in the kitchen at that point? Was it Justin? It was Smiley and, uh, and Roel. So two of the finest cooks ever worked for me, uh, Justin Smiley, who's at Upland in New York, or in Upland in Miami, if you get a chance to go there. And Justin's about six foot... Six five, 250. Yeah. And, and when, he, when he cooks... He just he kind of elbows you out of the way, and he, and he kind of bows up on you like this. I used to explain to Justin that he actually didn't have to talk to people because his size intimidated everybody. And Roel Acudia, who is down in Miami now at a restaurant uh, called Mandolin, if you've ever gone there, it's a wonderful Greek restaurant in Miami. Uh, Roel actually is um, by birth from Manila in the Philippines. And his mother is a cardiologist. I used to love when his mother bought those dumplings things. Anyway, um, we digress. Can you turn that up a little bit, please? Yeah. Hunter? So we're going we're gonna to put some uh, grill marks on these guys and then throw them in the oven at 425. How long does a chicken take to cook? Anybody? Raise your, raise your hand. Not you, Ellen. <laughs> Somebody? Yes. Oh, not you, too. Dean Shook. Yes. Shout it out for me. What size chicken is that? Okay, so that this is the big mystery in life. How long does it take to cook a chicken? Um, generally, it takes between 10 minutes and 12 minutes a pound. Everybody overcooks your chicken. They all, you guys all overcook chicken, don't you? You guys, like my grandmother, you just cook it to death. Or you take it out before the skin is, is, is golden brown, right? Who does, it, who does it perfectly out there? Raise your hand. Okay, so ma'am, how, how do you do it perfectly? 500 degrees for? 10 minutes, and then what do you do? Then you have a cocktail, and then you do what? So you drop it down to 425. Okay, so that's actually a pretty good technique, 500 degrees down to 425. But the single most thing about a whole roast chicken, which we're not going to do today, is what? There's one magical thing that happens that you have to do. It starts with a B and ends with an E. Base. You've got to base your chicken. And you don't, if you base your chicken the first 15 minutes, you're wasting your time. You might as well have your cocktail in the first 15 minutes and wait for the chicken to start talking to you. So when you put the chicken in the oven, you put it which side up? The roast chicken. On its back, right? But there's a key here that you put it in a pan that the chicken can move around in. All right? So um, the reason for that is you want to be able to shake the chicken so you don't want the skin to get stuck to the pan. Right? Okay? And when you're basting the chicken, you, you need to have... The best thing in the world is a, is a welder's glove. Get two welder's gloves. And um, maybe we should do welder's Never mind. Um, and that way you can hold the pan and you won't get burnt. You can tilt it and put the spoon away from you and baste that chicken. How often do you baste a chicken? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Every, as, as often as you can. Now, everybody said, well, I'm, I don't want to open the oven up because the oven's going to get cold. By the way, all your ovens suck, just so, just so you know. 
Yeah, don't be afraid of 450, 500. So it's, it's, it's super important to have two thermometers in your oven because your oven is just horrible in your house. Um, most, it's true, I'm sorry. Whoever spent $20,000 on a, a, yeah, I spent 20 grand, but it's not cooking the way I want to. You have to get them calibrated. It's super important. Your gas company, your electric company, will, they'll, they'll calibrate them for you. All right, so, so we've got our spatchcock chicken. We've got our half chicken. Um, we're, chick we're cooking chicken on the bone, and we're cooking chicken skin side down because we want to make the skin really crispy. And the, the skin and the fat the underneath the skin is going to help keep the, the, the flesh really, really the juicy. So we've got chicken thighs. This is another master recipe. This is a technique I learned from Jonathan. We've got chicken thighs, a lot of salt, a lot of pepper, a, a hot cast iron pan with a little canola oil. And these are going to cook skin side down almost the whole way. This is dead simple. You can riff on it any which way. Did you, um, did you put enough seasoning on those? Yes, a lot of salt. Chef. And the you other thing... Is pepper flakes on too? We'll do that at the end. Uh, the other thing, when, when, you're, when you're doing the chicken, uh, you want to make sure that the skin is dry. That's going to help crisp it up even more. And so see what's happening with the chicken. They're starting to get these nice grill marks. And what am I holding the chicken with? A fork, why? If you use tongs, what happens? You rip, you rip the skin, okay? So you want to be careful. I, I was looking for a kitchen fork, which I can't seem to find. I know there's a beautiful KitchenAid kitchen fork waiting for me around here and somewhere in my life. And you, you see what I just did? I flipped them 90 degrees. You don't use tongs? No, not anymore. You're not a tweezer kind of guy, though, are you? Yeah, for my eyebrows. You're, you're, not, a, you're not a tweezer chef. I feel like I'm old now. I get those weird hairs. Never mind. I started to get those in my ears. All right, so. All right, so I just, I just, and, and the beauty of doing that, turning 90 degrees, you're going to get a gorgeous, uh, what we call, the French call quadrillage. Right, Dean? Quadrillage. Dean's here, so it's time to make margaritas. Oh, okay, before we start making margaritas, so uh, years back, uh, I think it was Roel. Was it Roel that started these potatoes? Anyway, so Roel Alcudia, who's a, simply a brilliant cook. And I think what you have to understand about restaurants, it ain't all about me. I'm very lucky. It, it really takes a community in the restaurant. It really takes a community, a village, but really it's more like a family to make the restaurant work. And um, Hunter will attest to this. You want to just throw them in the oven like that? Yeah. Let's leave it on this. Okay. All right. Let's. We're gonna we're gonna turn this off and throw it in the oven. Okay. You ready? Let's yep. do it. So, could you guys put a, a timer for five minutes for me, please? Somebody. Thank you. Anyway, so um, back in the day. Uh, People used to. What was that? I'm not even going there. Um, people used to double double cook potatoes, right? So Royal Ro came up with this idea of poaching potatoes, russet potatoes, um, in garlic, rosemary, and a tremendous amount of salt. They cooked them for about 45 minutes and then let them chill. They actually were the potatoes we used for gnocchi. But we were multitasking, multi-use. So we decided to do, well, he decided that why don't, we, why don't we just fry them up? And I'll show you what's going to happen when you fry them up. So when I start, first started working with Jonathan, I thought, why is this guy making chicken and potatoes? At the time, he was doing French fries before we started doing the crisp potatoes. Why would you do chicken and potatoes? And uh, he's told me about four different stories about why. Um, but I think a part, of it, part of it is that you can't hide behind it. You know, it's, it's, it, it's the simplest thing you could do in the kitchen. Roasting a chicken is, is one of the things that you should master as a home cook. And it really showcases the quality of the chicken, a well-raised chicken. Um, quality of your technique, your seasoning, and you can't hide behind it. And um, 
not long ago, my wife Ellen, who's in the front row, we had a, a friend of ours, Chef John Kern, took from uh, Oxford, Mississippi, came over to Birmingham where I live. We had him over, and I thought, you know, whenever I have a chef over, what am I, what am I gonna make? Let's do something really simple. Um, chefs don't often get cooked for, uh, because people are intimidated to cook for them. So stock the fridge with a lot of champagne and uh, some rosé, and we made chicken and potatoes. And I got an email from him the next day, and he said, uh, John cusses a lot, so I'm not gonna say exactly what he said. But he said, uh, he said, dude, thank you so much. Sometimes all I want in my life is chicken and potatoes, and you delivered. So uh, the next time you guys have friends over or a chef over, uh, just make them some really good chicken potatoes and a margarita. All right, so the potatoes are in at 275, 280. Now the problem, one of the problems is, what altitude are we at? 8,000 feet. Cooking sucks at 8,000 feet. <laughs> Everything goes sideways. Um, I was, uh, I judged Top Chef uh, the season last year at Aspen, and we did, we, we, we were at the top of the mountain, so these poor, these poor devils had to cook at 10,000 feet. And I was talking to Joe Flam yesterday, who actually won, I said, how tough was it? He goes, Jonathan, don't even ask. Um, so, you know, uh, Mike Latta from Charleston, it, it, he boiled it, it, peanuts for 36 hours up there, and they weren't even halfway done. It, it, it does. It, it literally dries you to drink. I'm sorry. <laughs> Everything goes wrong. You put meat on the grill, and because it's so dry here, you know, at the top of the mountain, it's like 10 to 20 percent humidity. All the humidity comes out of the steak or whatever you're cooking, and you look at it and say, what the hell happened? Anyway, so you have to be... You have to be prepared for every contingency. Now, With a lot this, of rosé. On this, on the thighs, Hunter's got them too low a temperature. <laughs> Let me, we, we had three different chefs that worked under Jonathan. We had the chef de cuisine, uh, we had two sous chefs, and, and then we had Jonathan. And every time a different chef walked in the room, they taught you a different way to do this. But who was always right? So you had to alter that technique depending on which chef was coming through. So what that taught me is that cooking's not black and white. There's a lot of gray. Uh, and, and it really is. It, it's it not, it's, cooking's not about absolutes. It, it really does ring true that everybody is entitled to their own opinion. But I'm always right. <laughs> and I'm old now, so I can say that. All right, so um, anybody know the origin of Meyer lemons? Anybody? Anybody out there? Dean? Five minutes? Thank you very much. Anyway, I'll give that one sec. So, uh, Meyer lemons are not a cross between orange and lemon, but yeah, actually they really are. Uh, there was a botanist from the University of California who was uh, stomping around China in the late 19th century, and he found these, the origin of the Meyer lemon in China. And guess his name was? Meyer. Hello. All right, so you've got. Wait a minute, you know what? That just brings to mind something. Maybe I'll use Meyer lemons in my margarita. So, Jonathan was a, uh, a musician way back in the day. Um, he had some pretty great hair. And uh, was it, uh, you were a, a trombone player, right? Yes, sir. In a rock and roll band? Yes, sir. Um, did you I study? Actually, I played for Sammy Davis Jr. And um, I got fired afterwards. <laughs> I was so nervous because in those days, you, I, I played the casinos in Reno, Nevada. And I played at the Nugget. Anybody ever been in the Nugget Casino? Oh, yeah. And Birth of the Elephant came on, and luckily she didn't shit all over the stage. And then she, I, Sammy Davis Jr. came on, and I was so scared, I just blew every note. <laughs> actually, I stopped playing. That, that seemed like the best remedy. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, yeah, I interrupted. That's all right. Um, all right, so you, you, you're cutting the lemons and you're, you're putting them right in the pan, cut side down. They're gonna get some char on them. Um, and then we're gonna use these charred lemons and this chicken fat and the chicken juice. And we're gonna make a quick uh, chicken fat Jew vinaigrette. Uh, it's a very simple sauce. Um, and, and the schmaltz that comes out of the chicken skin it's liquid gold, so don't throw it away. Uh, it's better than baking grease. 
uh, for pretty much everybody. Anybody been to Sammy's Romanian in New York? Oh yeah. And they put Schmaltz on the table. Health department really loves that. <laughs> All right. So why th this chicken continues to cook in the in the fat? Uh, and and kind of what is the most important thing about this technique? Cooking skin side down only. Yep. Oh shit. I'm sorry. I skin, about my skin side here. down only and uh, skin side all down for at least 80 percent of the time. And, and cook chicken on the bone. Look, chicken breasts are fine. Um, you know, most of our readers, the magazines, they prefer chicken breasts. But chicken thighs especially have the best flavor. Chicken wings, the best flavor. Because you get the, the best skin to meat to bone ratio. And meat closer to the bone is the juiciest. So look what's best. happening inside the oven, guys. So I'm going to leave these on the grill a little bit longer so they get crispier skin. Because... Um, what happens is that the fat inside the chicken, the subcutaneous fat, starts to boil. So the heat of the conductivity between the iron, the heat of the oven, starts to get the skin to boil, and that's how you get the crisp skin, okay? All right, well, Jonathan's doing that. I'm going to make one of his classic recipes. This is salsa verde. It's basically Italian ketchup. Uh, Barbudo is a rustic Italian restaurant. Some... Uh, French influence from south of France. Uh, but this salsa verde is super elemental. And Hugo, it's not tomatillo, just so you know. <laughs> Hugo, just so you know, okay? You got it? There's no tomatillos here. That's another salsa Ooh, verde. Salsa verde different. Hugo's salsa verde is by the, the best salsa verde in the world, by the way. It really is. I'm sorry, but it's true. Um, so Jonathan's salsa verde uh, it starts with a base, a really, really pungent base of garlic and anchovy and capers and some chili flakes. Um, you guys know what this is? There you go. How many people here, raise your hand, how many people own a mortar and pestle? That's not enough. You need to have at least three of these in your kitchen. A, they look cool, but B, they, be, they make food even more delicious because when you are pounding with a mortar and pestle versus putting something in a blender, you're slowly coaxing out the flavor and the oils uh, of the ingredients that you're using. And uh, it's an ancient device, but it's one of the best tools in the kitchen. So I've got some um, salt cured anchovies here. We're gonna take them off the bone. You can do canned anchovies. If you can only get, you know, even rolling in a can, that's good. Um, anchovies and fish sauce are two ingredients that you should have in your kitchens. And even for people, I had a boss who hated fish and uh, especially hated anchovies. And so when he would come down to the test kitchen for, uh, for a tasting, I would secretly slip anchovies and vinaigrettes and the salsa verdes. He never knew the difference. So a year later, I gave him a can of anchovies. I said, we've been cooking with these the whole time, and, uh, and, and you need to learn how. So taking the, uh, the spines off, got a couple fillets here. We got some capers. And uh, Jonathan likes salt-cured anchovies, salt-cured capers, so we rinse them, rinse the extra salt off. And then we're just going to give these so a rough chop. The reason I like capers, um, do you know where uh, capers come from? Anybody? Pontelleria. Anybody know where Pontelleria is? Pontelleria is this beautiful island south of Sicily between right out the coast of, of Tunisia. And my partner, Fabrizio Ferri, has a little, well, he has a little something there. He actually has 150 acres of the most magnificent property you've ever seen in your life. And you, um, and when you see the, cape, the, the caper berries or the, the plants that the capers grow on, it's the, the wind from the Sahara blows across the island. So everything is grown very low down the ground, which intensifies all the flavors. When they grow tomatoes, um, because they can't really get them ripe on the ground, when they harvest them, they lay them on the front of their houses in the sunlight. And they kind of shrink up and they get just gorgeous and lugubrious, and, and you want to just go over and chew on the tomatoes on the side of the house. But the coolest thing about Pantelleria is they have these things called Jardin Hiver, which are 30-foot tall towers, about 30 feet in diameter, and that's where they grow their oranges, because the oranges can't stand the, the, the Scirocco that blows. So they, you, you climb up the top and look down, there's five little orange trees down there. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life. Um, so I added a little... I know this, these ingredients are salty. This is going to be the, the salty seasoning and base of the salsa verde. So see what's happening with the skin? It's starting to get really crisp, okay? And the fat, um, the fat around the edges is starting to bubble. 
That's exactly what you now want. Now remember, it's, it's, we're at altitude, and they're going to take longer than you think. Now these potatoes, unfortunately, can probably take about 25 minutes. So um, while Hunter's doing that, um, my general manager is in the front really loves aioli more than anything. Except aioli is not what everybody, anybody know what aioli really means? Anybody? Anybody has a guess? It's an old Languedoc or Provençal word being I, which is garlic, and oli, which is olive yeah. oil. That's what aioli is. Now, we all put eggs in nowadays, but that's beside the point. Um, I'm still going to use eggs, but um, if you want to make real aioli, you do it in a mortar and pestle. And it's just garlic, sea salt, and olive oil, nothing else. I'm actually going to make a little aioli for the potatoes, OK? All right, while Jonathan's doing that, I'm going to start chopping herbs. You can put whatever herbs you want. I, I, for my salsa verde, uh, which is a riff on Jonathan's, I use tender herbs. So you can do chives, cilantro, parsley. Um, you can do a little mint at the end, although it will brown. And the key here, you can, you can go as fine or as, as rough as you want. Um, but the key here is to, uh, to balance them out, you know, because this is going to mix with the olive oil, and it's going to be draped over the chicken and the juice and the fat from the chicken, the olive oil, the pungency of the anchovies and the garlic and the chili uh, really come together. And, and the best is when the salsa verde and the chicken juices start to pool on the plate. When you finish your chicken, you swipe the meat through. It's, it's the best thing in the world. So um, aioli is all about the garlic. And um, I spent a lot of time in the south of France um, and when you go to the markets there, they have the most beautiful garlic in the world. It's purple, it's white, it's just gorgeous. Uh, the garlic we get in this country, if you, did anybody go to the market today in, in downtown, in Aspen? There was some actually beautiful garlic. It was $2.50 for one bulb. So it shows how hard it is to grow garlic up here. Um, so what you want to make sure is you cut the garlic in half, and then there's this little green germ that you want to remove, right? Anybody know why? What's that? Bitter, but also it's the thing that gives garlic a bad name. It's that weird flavor that we, when you go to like a really bad Italian restaurant and they put way too much garlic in and they don't take this out and they burn the garlic, yikes. Anyway, I want to put two cloves of garlic in here. And... Oh, I'm sorry. They were poached in water to begin with. And you can steam them at home if you want to. If you have a steamer. You can actually bake them in the oven in the skins if you want to do that. And then do the same technique. It's actually much... <laughs> there are no mistakes. There's only opportunities, right? <laughs> Tell that to my partners. Um, Okay, so um, I used to, when I had jams originally back in the 80s, I didn't allow a deep fryer in my restaurant. I had, all I had was this big thing, a big rondo, where I forced all my chefs to cook these french fries that I used to cook, which I don't cook anymore, um, but I actually do in jams, and it's a long story. Anyway, they had to cook them in a rondo on top of the stove. Um, and it, it was really horrible to me to do that. Also, I didn't allow any any devices like immersion blenders. Yeah, there was one stage where... Um, but I love my immersion blender. We went through one phase where we weren't allowed to use any tools that were plugged in. So we were making, I remember the summer of 05, we were making gallons of pesto in more than pestles. So I think it was, the, I think it was uh, Smiley, he was getting inspired by uh, Bertoli's cooking by hand. Yeah. Yeah, and trying to torture us. There's a, a funny story about Justin Smiley. When he worked at, I uh, had a restaurant called Washington Park. He was so horrible. He was almost as bad as Hunter. And um, he would, um, he'd be so bad that I'd tell him to go down the walk and then do 25 push-ups. <laughs> now, is that harassment? No, I think it's incentive. It was good for him. And you want to be happy when you crush your garlic, okay? 
and you want to think about somebody you really don't like. So it's my watch. Because what you want to do is you really want to smash the garlic, okay? And that's a little too much garlic for me, so I'm going to put about half that in there. I'm going to add some sea salt. And some people put uh, lemon juice. I don't. And I love my immersion blender. So are those chicken thighs going to be done in the next seven minutes, Chef? Say about, uh, they need about 10 more minutes. If you want, you got, we can. You we have can, seven. You've got seven? All right. So if you're you on want, the line of the restaurant, I think you have seven minutes left. What do you have to do? Never, been, never been good with time. Flip I'm going gonna, gonna to finish these in the oven. Flip them over. They'll be fine. Yeah. So this is starting to thicken up nicely. It's really cheating, but, you know, as you get older, cheating is okay. And we have a lot of international, we have a lot of national, um, uh, never mind, I won't even go there. Um, you want to hold this for me, please? And see how beautifully brown they are? You see that? You have to be patient with Ioli, just let it go like that. Um, let's see how our potatoes are doing. They're getting there. I think those potatoes are on mountain time. Let's see our chickens in the oven. So Does how do you tell if the chicken's done, anybody? What temperature do you want to see? 165, anybody else? What's that? Don't ever listen to the US, USDA. USDA is, is not telling you the truth. Get a good chicken and, uh, and, and don't cook it beyond 155. So, you ready for more? So th another good thing about this this whole deal here is that you can make it ahead. You know, before your guests come, you can have the chicken almost finished. It'll smell at the house. It'll smell delicious. You can have your salsa verde made. You, you've already had two glasses of rosé. You should feel good. You've done your hair, and um, and you the, you can finish with frying the potatoes. So the chicken, this chicken especially, chicken on the bone is very <laughs> forgiving. Um, it'll stay juicy. It'll stay warm. You could put it in a low oven. You put it like at you know, 175 degrees, um, and as your guests arrive, then you just pull it out, you let it rest, have a cocktail, have a snack, and, uh, and then carve it, and you're ready to go, and it, it makes it look effortless. All right, let's see how, how hot these guys are. And so I've got uh, chives, parsley, and cilantro. Those are my three herbs in here. Um, I've got the base, the very pungent base, and then all we do is just finish with, um, we just finish with some olive oil. 155. <laughs> so, who said rest? Raise your hand. Who said rest? You're a genius. So resting is super important. Uh, we let these chickens rest at the restaurant for at least 20 minutes before we serve them. And uh, Hunter, uh, yeah. you think those thighs are going to get done in time? Yeah, I think we're good. Let's, let's throw them right in the oven, and we're good. They'll, they'll finish up. All right, I'm going to cheat here because I want to use your pan for something else. Do it. And improvisation is the key here. When things aren't going perfectly, 
the way you want them to, like everything in life. You do what Tom Brady does. Mary Giselle. All right. So, I'm not happy with my potatoes. So I'm going to give them a little boost. Is there any butter in there? Yeah. Yeah. Butter helps everything. Who's got a spider right behind you? You want it? What's that? A little spider. Oh, there you go. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. It's like the surgery. Everybody's handing you the wrong scalpel. <laughs> it's the brain, damn it. Throw some butter in there for me. Butter helps everything. They're starting to brown a little bit. Can you see that? But since um, this little nice lady with a placard saying we have three minutes left. All right, while you're finishing up the potatoes, we've got salsa verde done. Chickens are uh, resting. Roasting, resting. Uh, the chicken thighs are finished roasting. And we're going to go ahead and make up two margaritas. So Jonathan's got a great margarita recipe. Mine is way better. Um, I learned my margarita recipe at Jonathan's restaurant. I have to tell you honestly, um, Hugo Ortega, where are you? Raise your hand. He makes the best damn margarita, except for maybe Dean Faring. And Dean Faring, where are you? He makes, it's a tale of two cities. It's Dallas versus Houston. I'm sorry, guys. All right, so my margarita, I learned uh, at Jonathan's restaurant. It was called Rest West County Grill in Sebastopol, California. Helped Jonathan open up the restaurant. Um, it was a blast to be cooking out there. It's the best ingredients in the world. And there was a, a guy named Omar. And Omar, if we had a really good chip, uh, if we cooked well, if the, if the service was, was dialed in, he would make his special margarita. So this is my riff on it. My, my family uh, now uses this. Everybody has the recipe. And it's dead simple. This is our go-to for the summer. So there's a great restaurant in San Francisco called Zuni Cafe. Anybody know it? And the, the late proprietor was a woman named Judy Rogers. And Judy Rogers and I cooked at Cape Panisse together in 1977, 78. And not only is she, was she the most lovely person on the planet, when she was in high school, she somehow did a, an exchange with a family and friends, and she ended up with the Quadro brothers. She didn't go there for culinary. She went there for educational purposes. So she got an education in the greatest restaurant in France. Anyway, so um, at Zuni Cafe, they make their um, their margaritas a little bit the way I make it. Um, they use Mexican lime or key lime. Why, One. why key lime? You're just being a contrarian? I like being contrarian. I'm using Persian. They left work. The problem with Persians these days um, it, some of them, sometimes they're so horrible. You get them in the market, and you can use them as a, uh, as a baseball. And that's the problem with ingredients and recipes. A lot of times you want to make a, a, a dish, and, and the thing you buy in the market tastes like, you know, like the bottom of your shoe, and you want to know what the hell to do. Anyway, these limes look good to me. I hope they taste good. Can I have your... Um, no. He's slow, too. The problem is the younger generation is very slow making cocktails. I'm southern. <laughs> I'm on island time. So I like mine shaken straight up. All right, so I've got one and a half Persian limes, some agave. And I start with the agave first after the lime juice because I'm going to wash the rest of the agave out of the jigger with the tequila. So I'm going to stick my little martini glasses in tequila and pink Hawaiian salt. Fancy. Mm. I, don't, I don't salt my rim. I'm going to do one salt and one not salt. And what kind of tequila are you using? Reposado? Um, Reposado. You know what? I don't think tequila is that important sometimes. It's more about the technique and the chef. 
wish I could say I, I agreed with you. Um, all right, so I'm using silver tequila. I like a really, really clean, smooth flavor. Um, some people like more aged tequila or mezcal in their margaritas. But I want, I want everything to blend together harmoniously. Really good balance between the agave, the are tequila, gonna, and the Are lime. you going to cut bait or fish? I'm going to do both. So mine are about four ounces or so. I don't like pouring too much in the glass because I'm so clumsy. I, I want to make sure I get from here to the couch to watch Tom Brady. So you I actually started off as a bartender in Hawaii in 1973 at Celestia Harpoon. Sounds like a tiki bar. It was, and um, I was a damn good bartender. So, I have to wait a while for my colleague here. <laughs> while I'm waiting for him, I'm going to cut up the chickens. All right, so to cut up the chickens, Hang, hang on, Jonathan, hang on. I'm not hanging while, while you're doing that, uh, let's get Dean Fearing up here, uh, awesome chef from Dallas, to, uh, to judge our margaritas. Dean, you mind coming up? Do you have the Quantra over here? The other secret of my margarita, it's uh, lime, oh, agave, the chicken, the chicken breath. Oh, man. Isn't that perfect? There. What do you think, Dean? Is that perfect? Is that perfect. perfect? It's perfect, right, guys? Uh, potatoes are getting done. Um, Very nice. I slipped him twenty bucks last night. We bought new dinner. No, we bought him dinner. Do you remember that? Very nice. So as, as Dean's tasting margaritas, so the drill is cut the chicken in half and then cut deftly between the, the thigh and the leg. Put the legs on in a very artful fashion. <laughs> All right, you got to try that, uh, that fancy pants yeah, margarita. Let's, let's try it. And I know you've known the guy for a long time. No, no. no it's not bad. This tastes like Mexican. Ooh. Ooh. And isn't that what margaritas taste like? Uh, I actually have to tell you that uh, at Dean's restaurant in Dallas and, uh, and all of Hugo Ortega's restaurants, how many do you have now? 35? Um, it's, it's so wonderful to go to a place and get a real margarita because there's so many Airsats versions out there that um, you want to drink that one? I'll drink this yeah. one. Yeah, Cheers. Absolutely. Dean and I have known each other for 40 years. And we were talking about this last night um, that it gets better and better and better. So everybody out there that aspires or you're, you might be thinking about changing career, don't, because it does get better in spite of some of the trials and tribulations. It is. Um, and the thing about timing is you want everything. Can you stall, put salsa vinegar in there for me? Sure. You want everything to be done at the same time. So you guys see how the salsa verde, it's almost bound with the olive oil. The, the herbs are kind of floating in it. You can use less olive oil, you can use more. It's about the consistency, I like it. And one of the reasons why is that it's easier to spoon. You just kind of spoon and drape the herbs over. And this is pretty much exactly how you get it at Jonathan's restaurant, unless he changes the menu at 5 p.m. and uh, you have to redo all your prep, which happens every now and then if he's in a bad mood. I'm never in a bad mood anymore. 
The Xanax oh. is working great. The Xanax and the uh, Aspen gummy bears. Yeah, actually, the gummy bears are, are my, are my go-to these days. Um, but Dean and I uh, did a show with Bobby Flay last year. We did, actually, you remember we did? We did, remember we did Salsa Verde? Yeah. Yes. Who won? Jonathan. You know, Bobby Flay cooked for Jonathan at, at Jams when you, uh, when you opened Jams in, what was that, like 1947? He also worked for Nick. That's good. So, crispy chicken thighs with charred Meyer lemon, the Meyer lemon and the Jew and the, uh, and the, the smalt all come together. Great sauce, super simple. We got crispy potatoes with a little frou-frou rosemary and uh, <laughs> some Parmesan. And then we've got the JW roast chicken with salsa Woo! verde, Jonathan's margarita, my margarita, Dean Fearing. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you all. Cheers. Thanks, buddy. That was great. Great job. Cheers, guys.